ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jensen Huang. Hello, LA. Welcome to the first ever 24 hour celebration of PC gaming. What do you think about that? We're gonna have product announcements. We're gonna show you technology you've never seen before. All right, so let's get started. Gaming is huge. Gaming is huge and we're all about gaming. There are hundreds of millions of gamers around the world now. People thought it was a fad. People thought it was a waste of time. Not us. There are hundreds of millions of gamers. There's a couple of hundred GeForce gamers around the world. And it all starts with great games. Game is adventure. Game is art. Game is puzzle. Game is competition. Game is social. Game is sport. From absolutely nowhere, just a few years ago, there are now over a thousand tournaments each year. Stadiums packed full of people. Price money, over a million dollars. Professional gamers, professional teams, training, living together, playing 24 seven. And the reason for that is because people are intense about games. They love to game. There's skill involved in gaming. There's ability in gaming. And let's face it, those who are dedicated to it are just better than everybody else. It's more than a sport. It's a spectator sport. Never thought, never thought I'd see the day where other people watch us game. Where other people watch us game. It is so fun, it is so fun, it's so amazing that people are tuning in all over the world, watching Twitch, 55 million viewers in a month. Crazy talk, absolutely crazy talk. More people watch League of Legends champion than all of the NBA finals. I love LeBron, but we're bigger than LeBron. <laughs> gaming is huge, gaming is huge. And we love gaming, I love what we've built together. It's taken us about 20 years to get here. I love what we've done together. We did it all together, we own this. Thanks you guys. Our promise to you is number one, to build the most advanced platform in the world. We dedicate ourselves to delivering on that promise every single day. We hire the world's best engineers, engineers whose lives work is computer graphics, engineers who dedicate themselves, backed by billions of dollars of R&D, to build the world's best GPUs for you. We want to build the world's most advanced technology platform. But we also know that in final analysis, it's about great games. It's about amazing games, beautiful imagery, amazing experience. That's not possible without just a lot of mathematics. One of the things that you'll see today is all of the things that we've enjoyed up to now. Recognizing that computer graphics is one of the most computationally intensive fields in computing, it's all about mathematics. And we're gonna show you a lot more mathematics today. We wanna make it so that you can play in more ways. It's not just about sitting in front of your PC. It's not just about that, it's absolutely about that, but it's not just about that. We want you to be able to enjoy in 3D. We want you to be enjoying surround. We invented game stream so that you could stream your PC game to TV if you want. Stream it to your mobile device if you want. If you had a shield, you'll be able to stream it all the way out of your house if you want. We have other ways we would like you to be able to enjoy your games. One of our newest ways is G-Sync. Really, really excited about the invention. Our innovation is now extending beyond the GPU, beyond system software, all the way out to the PC, into the monitor, making it possible for you to enjoy just silky smooth graphics with a revolutionary technology called G-Sync. We have so much more that we want to share with you. And lastly, it's PC. It's open. It's for everybody. Everybody gets to play. We make our experience wonderful whether you have a basic PC with a GeForce inside, all the way up to a water-cooled quad SLI driving multiple 4K monitors, a PC that costs more than most average cars. We want you to be able to enjoy great games irrespective of the computer you have in front of you. 
To make it possible, hundreds of engineers at NVIDIA work around the clock to test every single permutation of your PC, every single game, and find what we call the optimal playable setting. And for you, all you have to do is make it one click, and bam, you're enjoying that game as good as it possibly can be enjoyed on your PC. Everybody gets to play. That is our promise to you. Today, today, we would like to continue, extend, raise the bar in that promise to you. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about Maxwell. There are four things I want to talk to you about. There are four things I want to show you. The first is the processor. What is called the Maxwell SM, the Maxwell Streaming Multiprocessor. You know that we invented the general purpose processor of modern computer graphics. It's possible to, of course, compute all kinds of wonderful pixel shaders, make every single pixel the scene incredibly beautiful. You, we use it for physics. It's a general purpose, massively parallel processor. Thousands of processors are working in parallel, communicating over these fabrics and crossbars, working together to generate a re result as fast as possible. The Maxwell SM. Everything starts from that. Making it as computationally efficient, as architecturally efficient, is the work of hundreds of engineers. In the case of Maxwell, we combed it up and down. And the reason for that is this. We had to make this architecture perfectly compatible with mobile. We had to bring it to Tegra as well. And as a result, energy, efficient, energy efficiency was job number one. Well, it turns out today, in all of computing, we are power limited. So your architectural performance for energy efficiency is directly related to your performance. In the case of Maxwell, in the case of Maxwell, in just one generation relative to Kepler, we improved the architectural efficiency, the performance per watt, by a factor of two. Second thing of the architecture, memory bandwidth is vital. To us, memory bandwidth is air. Memory bandwidth is air. In our frame buffer, we store textures, we store lighting information, we store bump information, we store all kinds of information, including the frame, the Z buffer. How fast we're able to communicate with that frame buffer directly determines our performance. In the case of Maxwell, we've now implemented our third generation of delta compression. Basically what that means is this. Every single color, as we're writing it out to the frame buffer, we compare it to the last value we're about to write. And we simply write out the delta. That last scene that you just saw, everything that's pink was compressed. As a result of that, Maxwell's memory interface was able to reduce the traffic by 30%. Really, really amazing. The two things combined, the SM architecture efficiency, the memory bandwidth amplification. As a result of that, comparing Maxwell to Kepler. Whenever I compare against Kepler, I'm going to compare everything to GTX 680, our first Kepler. Comparing against Kepler across a large number of very challenging games, the performance, energy efficient, Performance per watt of Maxwell versus Kepler is 2x. Unbelievable. So let me just read that off to you. Kepler, average frame rate of those games at 25 by 16, 25 frames per second, consuming 195 watts. In the case of Maxwell, 41 frames per second, but consuming only 165 watts. But you guys know what it means when you're energy efficient. It's a technology called overclocking. That's right, overclocking. This is going to be the mother of overclockers. We know it's all about games, so what are you going to do with all of this horsepower? What are you going to do with all this horsepower in Maxwell? Well, create even more amazing special effects. You know that we have this team in our company, we call the GameWorks Lab. And we have this engine, the libraries, mathematics, algorithms, created by some of the world's best computer graphics engineers, special effects engineers, computational mathematicians. And they solve some really, really amazing problems. And they run those algorithms on our GPUs. 
We call it the GameWorks team. The work that they do is really about doing for real-time computer graphics what ILM, what Industrial Light and Magic does for film. We know today that having a great and fun game is really important still. But production value matters. Production value matters. And production value, the exquisiteness of the image that you see, the beauty of the images that you see, how wonderfully it works, we expect it to amaze us generation after generation. We expect it to blow us away, just as we do when we go to a brand new movie. That's what this team does. We translate mathematics into amazing imagery. Now, one of the benefits, of, the, of course, is long term, not only do we get wonderful games, we know that it's impossible for artists to meticulously paint and create through art the real world. It is just simply not possible. We have to do it from first principles. And the first principles are the principles of physics. And so let me show you some stuff now. Rev, let's show them turf. Let me just tell you what you're seeing. You know, usually, the way that grass is done is through large, large, expansive texture maps. And they prop them up as billboards. And the billboards of these texture maps are translucent so that you see through it except for the part that looks like grass. But we know that grass doesn't work like that. We know grass doesn't look like that. And when grass is made like that, unfortunately, it can't interact with nature. When the wind blows, when the sun changes its place in the sky, when you walk through the grass, when you roll around in it, when you throw boxes and throw things at it, we would expect the grass to, that's right, I know it's craziness. In order to do all this, every single blade of grass has been converted to geometry. In fact, if you look closely, every single blade of grass is a V shape of grass, and it's curved and fully tessellated. As a result of that, because it's just another geometric object, it behaves properly with everything else inside the scene. When you change the lighting, when you throw things at it, it behaves exactly as we expect. <laughs> and Rev, did you change the light? Change the light source a little bit. Look at that. It all just works. Turf effects, brand new. Thank you, Rev. Anytime. PhysXFlex Flex is the world's first real-time unified physics solver. What that means is this. Whether it's particles, fluids, smoke, water, rigid bodies, flexible bodies, cloth, rope, whatever objects are inside that environment behaves according to the first principles of physics and is one singular unifying solver. Well, we've been able to do all kinds of great things we're gonna show you in just a second, but there are three brand new special effects that are just utter utterly amazing. Uh, but what you're looking at here is this. You're looking at a body of fluid, and it has uh, objects in it. The objects have mass. The objects have buoyancy. When you drag it around, it has drag. It bumps into each other. When it bumps into each other, it behaves physically as we expect. You stir the water. It would do exactly what you expect. Now, imagine if you're in some game, Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, and we wait, you wade yourself into a lake, and it did just this, because every single atomic particle is performing according to the laws of physics. And so the unified solver, irrespective of what objects we're talking about, would simply behave according to physics. Well, if you behave according to physics, and if you're liquid, you have the ability to change phases phase changing. Let's take a look at another demo. This demo is kind of fun. You can kind of imagine. Um, those three rabbits, first of all, are kind of like um, jello rabbits. By simply changing the interaction, the force between the atomic particles, we can cause the object to change shape, change phase. What else can we do? This is viscosity. Uh-huh, that looks a little bit like milk. That looks a little bit like milk. 
You're simply looking at the visualization of mathematics. Every one of those globs of milk or milkshake, depending on the viscosity that, that um, uh, the rev, rev has selected, is just a particle. And that particle is colliding with other particles. Those particles, when they collide with other particles, have some amount of surface tension. There's physics between, there's field between, forces between those particles. And they behave according to what we would expect them to behave. Now, if we were, if it is so, we should be able to even go to the extreme and cause some of these particles when they collide and touch each other to not bounce off, but to stick to each other. And so maybe, Rev, why don't we uh, do the next thing? Imagine if I were to throw some goo at this monster, but instead of bouncing off, instead of bouncing off, <laughs> Now this, this, you guys know this is gonna be a brand new BFG weapon. It's gonna be a brand, it's gonna be a brand new gun, the goo gun. And you just gonna, I believe this is what you call sliming them to death. Okay, all of this is made possible by the PhysX Flex Unified solver. We treat everything like particles, like atomic particles. We give every one of, the ato of those atomic particles physical behaviors, associate with them, fields, force fields. And so when they interact with other particles, they do the appropriate things, just like physics does. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're going to do with the 2x increase in perf per watt, which will translate to 2x increase in perf over time. Thank you, Rev. That was my first thing. Now I want to talk about 4K. Well, as it turns out, as you guys know, 4K monitors are starting to come down in price. However, while we're trying to increase the fidelity of every single pixel, we're also trying to make every single pixel more beautiful. When we make every single pixel more beautiful, we add more geometry to the scene, we do more special effects to it, each one of the pixel that you see has much, much more math behind it. So when 4K comes along, we've got to find a way to deal with how to drive that monitor. On the other hand, there are many games that we play. League of Legends, Dota, Dark Souls 2. These games, they're basically running full out at 60 hertz. And when you put a Maxwell in your system, you're just going to run a lot faster in 60 hertz. And so the question is, how can we find a way for games that are already performance challenged, all of a sudden need to come to 4K, or for games that has plenty of frame rate already, how do we provide it with more fidelity? Well, the answer to that are two technologies that we've invented. One is called dynamic super resolution. The other technology we invented is called multi-frame sampled AA. So let me start with the first one, dynamic super resolution. Basically, what, what it does is this. Suppose you have a 1080p monitor. The vast majority of us still have 10, 1080p monitors. When you put a Maxwell in your system, you have so much horsepower. We will render your game in 4K, and we'll do an image processing pass to resolve that 4K back to 1080p, enhancing the visual quality pretty substantially. Why don't we uh, go to the demo? OK. So what you're looking at here is actually a, a game, Dark Souls 2. It's maxed out. It's got 4XAA on. And it's running you know, pegged at 60 frames a second. There's really nothing else to do to improve the fidelity. Now, what I want you to focus on is the grass. And you'll see just those tips of grass. They're kind of scintillating. You know, textures are coming in and out. That's because the textures are actually not being sampled uh, detailed enough. Using DSR, we can dramatically improve this look of the game. So let's switch to the DSR demo. And now Sean is doing a great job with the exact same setup, only now DSR is enabled. And if you look when he's panning, you can actually see the grass is much more solid. There's no more popping. There's no more texture problems. Both of these game, uh, examples are running at 19 by 10. But on, the, but on this example, we're rendering it at 4K. And then, as Jensen said, we're sampling it down. So let's go ahead and do the side by side. And now on the left-hand side, it's 19 by 10 again. So I'm going to scroll around a little bit. 
And again, look at the grass tips. Focus on the fact that there's like this weird shimmer. Okay, that's, that's not good. It's not supposed to be like that. Um, let's look at the right-hand side and do another pan. This is DSR. So the point is, we can dramatically improve the experience uh, with people that have a 19 by 10 monitor using the power of DSR and Maxwell. Wow, that's beautiful. Okay, good job, Tab. Thanks. Okay, so that's DSR. Well, here's the amazing thing about DSR. It's completely automatic. All you have to do is pop open GFE. It'll show you this resolution, basically the 4K resolution with a DSR behind it. And whenever Maxwell provides frame rates that are just utterly fantastic or ready, we will render it beyond your native resolution of your monitor to as high as 4K, and maybe one of these days beyond, and then using image processing, move it back to the native resolution of your monitor. The second technology that we invented is called MFAA, multi-frame sample anti-aliasing. And that's how fast it is, MFAA. The way that MFAA works is this. Look at the right, 4X MSAA. It's the workhorse of anti-aliasing today. Basically, the way it works is this. Um, if you look at the, the red line, which is the edge of a triangle, and in this particular case, the inside of the triangle is on the bottom. In MSAA, basically all we do is we mathematically calculate how many samples, how many of those dots are inside the polygon. In this particular case, uh, on the right-hand side, 4X MSAA, one quarter of the samples of the lower quadrant is inside the triangle, and therefore we will blend 25% color of the pixel inside a triangle with 75% of the color outside the triangle. In the case of the next pixel on the lower right quadrant, three samples are inside the triangle. In this case, therefore, we have three-quarter coverage, and therefore that sample or that pixel that you see has 75% of the color of inside the triangle and 25% of the color outside the triangle. Well, here's the problem with this. In the case of MSAA, now look at how many samples we have to generate more per pixel. Each one of those quadrants is basically one pixel, but we have to sample it four times. Every time you sample a line, you sample something, it takes some horsepower, it takes some performance. In the case of multi-frame sampled AA, the clever thing that we're doing is now on the upper left-hand frame M minus one, notice we're only doing two samples, but Maxwell is clever. He samples two samples in one frame, he changes the sample position and samples the other two samples in the next frame. Then what we do is we take multiple frames and using, again, an image processing pass, combine those pixels into the final result. Your eyes see no difference. Here's the beautiful thing. 4X MFAA has basically the quality of 4X MSAA, but it has the performance of 2X MSAA. That is the ultimate way of getting something for nothing. Okay. As a result of that, we can now deliver anti-alias images at a much higher performance. Let's take a look at that. And so in this particular scene, I'm going to focus in on that part of the window. Of course, there are sharp edges everywhere, and you know how we hate crawlies. And so we're going to zoom into that little tiny spot, and now look at the three bands. The first band is no anti-aliasing. This is the classic example of the creepy crawlies. The edges are very, very sharp. As you pan slowly across it, those stair steps are going to start moving up and down the screen, and you'll notice that as jaggies. You'll notice that as jaggies. So solution for that is to apply 4X MSAA, which is in the middle. We now sample every one of those pixels now four times. But, you know, of course, it adds a little bit of blurriness, basically a form of filtering, filtering on edges. And then on 4X MFAA, MFAA, notice on the right-hand side, all of the edges, whether it's vertical, all looks basically the same as MSA. In fact, there are many, many areas where MFA does an even better job, but on balance, it basically gives you the quality, the pixel quality of MSAA, 4X MSAA, at the performance level of 2X 
AA. Now this is what it looks like. The first green bar, the dark bar, the first dark bar basically shows you the performance gains that comes naturally for Maxwell. But when you turn on MFAA, the performance is dramatically higher. If you compare this generation to generation, we're getting 2x the performance boost. What do you think about that? The next thing I want to talk about is helping us enjoy games in more ways. One of the coolest things that's happening right now, the convergence of all kinds of technologies, is VR. How many of you guys have heard of Oculus? Well, we have a new platform, new SDK, new technology called VR Direct. VR Direct, it comes in three components. The first component is auto stereo. The second thing is the bane of existence of VR is latency. It causes you to feel nausea. It creates a great deal of discomfort through all kinds of techniques. We have reduced VR's latency to a point where you can enjoy the living daylights out of it. And then number three, a new technology called autosynchronous warp, asynchronous warp that I'm gonna explain in just a second that reduces the latency even further. Now let me very quickly explain latency to you guys. There are two basic sensors that tracks the movement of your head. There's the gyro, it's being sampled at about 1,000 hertz. There's a couple of cameras that's tracking your head that goes into what is called sensor fusion. I'm not showing that part here, just showing it as a dotted line. It's a few milliseconds. After that, it goes into the game. The game figures out what to do next, goes into the operating system, the operating system includes the system software, includes uh, the API, includes the transfer of commands from the API out over the PCI Express bus into the GPU. The GPU renders it, performs all the processing as fast as it can. In this particular case, I'm showing that this person already has a fabulous GPU, so this person is already enjoying the game at 60 frames per second. After that, it gets scanned out to the display. And so how quickly you scan those pixels up on the display takes a little bit of time, about 13 milliseconds to make sort of refresh rate of the, of the display. All of that added together is about 50 milliseconds. If you were inside a VR environment and the latency is somewhere between 60, 70, 80 milliseconds, it's intolerable, utterly intolerable. Between 30 and 40 milliseconds, you're having a great time. So the first thing that we can do is simply through great engineering, comb through every line of code and comb through every data transfer and reduce the latency every possible place as much as we can. We've done that. Job number one is just careful engineering. And with just careful engineering, the obsession to reduce latency, we've taken latency down to about 40 milliseconds. The second thing that we've done is we know that the resolution is already challenged. And so we want to create the best possible pixel we possibly can. Most of the time you're running with MSAA. In this particular case, why do that? Turn on MFAA. You'll get to save a few more milliseconds. Well, now you're down to about 36 milliseconds. Through an extraordinary amount of just careful engineering, clever new technologies, and a really, really fast GPU, you've got yourself 36 milliseconds. You can now enjoy VR. Well, we can take it even further than that, and that's this technology called asynchronous warp. The way asynchronous warp works is this. We've already rendered a frame, if we could predict where your head's going to be at, we might be able to take the previous frame and warp it so fast so that we don't have to recompute it. And so part of it has to do with projecting and predicting where your head's going to be at, but mostly it's about waiting until the very last second and recognizing that f the fact of the matter is most of the time your head doesn't move that fast. And the fact that the latency is already so low, we could predict and at the very last second, warp and put the screen up for you to enjoy. The fact is, VR is now here. The technology is sufficiently cost effective, the resolution's getting better and better, and most importantly, between the GPU performance, system software, and new clever techniques, we're able to get latency down really, really far, to the point where I believe this is gonna be a really, really cool new way to enjoy games. VR Direct, what do you guys think? Okay, I saved the best for last. Since the beginning of time, 
generating a photorealistic image has been a grand challenge for computer graphics, for real-time computer graphics. The problem is, on the one hand, simple. On the other one, incredibly hard to imagine how to solve. And the reason is this. Well, it turns out that light behaves according to laws of physics. And when they bounce off of, when they bounce off of objects and surfaces, those surfaces reflect based on laws of physics. Well, let me just take a look at this example right up here. There's a whole bunch of little lights they are emitting light, those little tiny light bulbs. Light is also coming in through the windows. This room is incredibly hard for computer graphics. Very few large sources of very bright lights. Most of the lights are rather subtle. All the shadows are incredibly subtle. All the materials are rather, rather different. And so they reflect light in very different ways. Well, this particular image is not a photograph. This particular image was rendered with NVIDIA's iRay. iRay is NVIDIA's physically based, otherwise physically simulated rendering system. And it runs on a, basically, a supercomputer. It takes several seconds, about three seconds, to generate. And it takes 150 GPUs. Now, what we would like to do, of course, do the same thing in real time. That is the grand challenge. I'm super excited to tell you that we, although it will take quite some time to achieve this level of realism, photorealism, in real time, we have found ways to simplify the problem, to approximate the problem. We've reduced the problem by several orders of magnitude, over a thousand times. And the way that we solve that problem is instead of tracing and following pixels, light beams bouncing off of pixels, we simplify this scene into a new data structure called voxels. Voxels are basically cube data structures. And each scene would be decomposed, reconstructed, it using what we call voxelization, re reconstructed into these little voxels. Imagine Minecraft. From there, we've simplified the data, the amount of data, from billions of pixels and billions of rays to millions and thousands. The technology is called VXGI. VXGI, Voxel Global Illumination. This is a giant step forward in lighting realistic, photorealistic environments. It's dynamic. It basically simulates one bounce. And with just one bounce, we can capture the vast majority of the amount of light energy that, as it bounces throughout the room. And because it's a general, unified algorithm for path tracing, we call it cone tracing. And because it's designed this way, it could be integrated into engines like Unreal Engine and others uh, in the near future. Now, let me show you uh, how global illumination works. Now, this particular demo is called the Cornell Box. Okay, there's several things I want you to look at before I switch the scene. The first thing I'd like you to look at is this. Notice that although the light is projecting downward, that the ceiling is lit. The second thing is this. Notice the creases on the ground, basically where the red wall, the green wall, intersects with the white floor. Notice it's lit wonderfully. All the creases are lit wonderfully. However, if you go up to the top, you'll see that, in fact, there are these dark shadows there. That's called ambient occlusion. The third thing I'd like you to notice is look at the size of the balls. In the case of the left-hand side, um, it's bleated some red paint. Um, on the right-hand side, it's some green paint has bleated onto the, onto the wall. And the reason for that, onto those balls, and the reason for that is because when light hits those walls, the red wall and the green wall reflect the light, and they become basically a light source. Uh, look at those three simple effects. And now, um, Curtis, let's go to state-of-the-art computer graphics using direct lighting. So a couple of things to notice. Notice the ceiling is dark. And the reason for that is because the light that's at the center of the room as it bounces off the floor never made its way back to the ceiling. Notice that the uh, ambient occlusion on the top, the corners are really dark. Look at the shadows. You would expect some light to go underneath those balls to light and create that soft shadow effect that you saw earlier. Now, here's what VXGI does. 
After it does the first direct pass, it will voxelize and simplify the scene. And from that simplification, discover where the light would bounce off of and where it would light other surfaces. And so what we'll do now is we'll show you using Maxwell's VXGI capability. And this is the really wonderful part. Uh, Curtis, let's, let's uh, move the light around. Oh, this is just fun. That is so beautiful. Guys, what do you guys think about that? Mm -hmm. On July 20th, 1969, three astronauts flew three days to the moon. Shortly after, Buzz Aldrin makes his way out of the limb and down the stairs. What you're looking at here is that seminal photograph that was taken by Neil Armstrong. Well, those photographs came back to Earth, and of course, to this day, still takes my breath away thinking about it. But at the same time, caused many people to be quite excited about whether the origin of this photograph was truly from the moon. There was good reason for them to question these photographs. First of all, when you look at that image of Buzz Aldrin, and you look at the shadows on the ground, the dark shadows, he's surely in shadow. If he's surely in shadow, because the sun is on the other side of the limb, how is it possible that he is that bright? Second, we know there's no atmosphere on the moon. And if there's no atmosphere on the moon, we should be able to see the stars. Now, with the invention of VXGI, and through the extraordinary efforts of our engineers, we meticulously model the lunar limb. It's made out of aluminum, aluminum foil, cloth, and a generous application of tape. It was a flying Coke can. <laughs> we modeled every detail. We modeled the surface of the moon so that we could start to study and test these mysteries and come to our own conclusion through scientific means whether it is possible whether they did land on the moon. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to demonstrate to you guys now our work. And so let's go through, let's test each one of those conspiracy theories. The first one is this. Uh, let's, let's assume that he is in shadow and that the only light source is direct. Well, this is what it would look like. And this is what people expected him to look like. And the reason for that is because the sun is on the other side of the limb. And you can also see the shadows on the ground are perfectly dark. So how is it possible that he's lit? Well, as it turns out, we modeled the entire surface of the moon. We modeled the dust particles of the moon, and, and we learned this. We learned that the dust particles on the moon, it's fine particles, and it in fact has reflective properties. Now, the reflective properties are not great. It only reflects about 10, 12% of the light that hits it. However, as in many type of dust particles and crystals, when a light hits it directly, and you look at it from the same angle as the light source, the reflected light is multiple times brighter than it otherwise would have reflected. It's a phenomenon called opposition surge. Well, we simulated the properties of the moon dust. And as you can see, right now, the sun is behind me. The limb is beside me. Notice the brightness of the sun as it's reflecting off the lunar surface. Well, suppose we were to turn on VXGI, and we turn every single surface into a light source so that it reflects the light. Let's see what happens. Well, voila. Well, that's mystery number one. Mystery number two is this. Why is it that while we're looking at him right now, we don't see the stars? Well, that's a simple answer. Turns out it's a simple matter of exposure. The light is so bright, in fact, that they had to change the exposure of their camera to the point where you're not over-blindingly bright, 
on the surface of the moon while therefore you're no longer able to see the stars. And so what we did was this. In fact, when we look out into, into the sky, we've modeled all 84,000 of the closest stars around Earth that we can see from Earth. And if we were to change our exposure, this is what we would see. Now, Curtis, what would happen now if we were to look back down? <laughs> now let's change the exposure again, please. Look how beautiful that is, huh? Hey guys, what do you think? Real-time computer graphics with real-time global illumination. Well, there's another conspiracy. This particular question was kind of interesting. Well, it turns out, when you look at this other iconic image of Buzz stepping on the moon, it's taken from a camera that plops down from the lamb. The theory that this, this photograph was in fact taken on Earth was because they, some believed that really bright light source beyond Buzz was in fact a light that they forgot or somehow mistakenly did not take out of the way when they took this picture. And so if we were to go back to our simulation, in fact, if you were to look at that, uh, well, shucks, that's an interesting question. Until, if you were to figure out where Neil Armstrong was standing when he took the other iconic photograph, you'll discover that, lo and behold, there's a white object there. Well, here's the amazing thing. Neil Armstrong's spacesuit is made out of largely Teflon, and it has a reflectivity of about 90%. And it helped us solve one last unexplained issue when we were working on this project. The one last thing we could never figure out is why is it that when we compared, we've modeled every little detail. Now, why is it that when we look at it, Buzz still seemed too dark? Well, it wasn't until we modeled Neil Armstrong and we put him in the scene that we were able to see the difference. How about let's uh, turn Neil on and off. The extraordinary detail that the engineers put into it is just really, really wonderful to see. And then lastly, let's compare the before and after. If you can go to slides. If you're not sure, the right side is the photograph. The left side is the simulation. What do you guys think? Now, one last mystery. I didn't even know, I didn't even know about this particular mystery. And, and uh, it turns out uh, we, weren't, we weren't the first ones there. That uh, before uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, uh, there was somebody else there. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are not alone. So, ladies and gentlemen, Maxwell. There were four things about Maxwell that are utterly groundbreaking. The first is two times the energy efficiency, two times the architectural efficiency. And because of the performance made possible by MFAA and also the, the chip itself, two times the performance which enables us to enjoy 4K. This is the first GPU that we have that connects directly to Oculus and other VR glasses in the future with VR Direct, enable you to enjoy VR with your PC. All of that is gonna make, be programmed and profiled and set up using GFE. And then lastly, the very first of its kind a giant step forward for, for real-time computer graphics, technology that makes possible real-time global illumination, VXGI. Ladies and gentlemen, the first flagship of Maxwell.
want me to throw it? Yeah. GTX 980, the first Maxwell flagship GPU. We're so incredibly proud of this. This is really, really a giant step forward for us. GTX 980, your first question is, how much does it cost? 2,048 cores, the fastest GPU in the world, even without considering MFAA, with that consideration, boosted even further, four gigabytes of memory, $549. The fastest GPU in the world. We do have one other, and this one is insane. The GTX 970, $329.